Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Nick Hughes. Nick, are you ready to be great today? Um, I'm very ready. Nick is a successful American entrepreneur with business achievements in e-commerce, social media, digital payments, and technology startups. He excels at interpersonal leadership, communication, business, and product development. Nick currently holds the position of CEO founder of the global entrepreneur platform, Founders Live. In addition to creating Founders Live, Nick stays busy as an advisor to numerous startups and occasionally takes positions in sales or business development roles if needed. Nick, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. Nick, you're like the modern man, modern rena renaissance man. Like you're <laughs> everywhere, you're traveling, doing a lot of good yeah. things. How, how do you day to day know what to focus on? Well, I, yeah, that's a very good question. And, um, you know, I think it just comes down to as an entrepreneur and as an executive, you know, you need to know your priorities from the company standpoint to personally. And, and you, you know, write those, you obviously write those down. You, um, if you're someone that, that runs a calendar, which I do, I block calendar and basically on any calendar, um, you know, I have notifications that tell me like, what literally my phone buzzes and says like, work on this, work on that. So, you know, I work the calendar and, um, you know, you focus on your priorities every month and every quarter and you got to do it. So let's talk about something kind of serious. Well, actually it's really serious. I can't remember when, maybe a few years ago, you wrote an article on depression. Can you talk yeah. about that? Cause I think one thing we're not talking about is entrepreneurs, the depression people go through, right? Yeah. And you know, I've even written recently, um, I don't know. I mean, maybe I do know why from, you know, just even the pandemic and everything, I, I've been dealing with burnout. And um, I think it has a lot to do with how hard we push ourselves as entrepreneurs. And um, yeah, I mean, I think in general, it is not easy to do what we do. And it's then easy to slip down the, 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 the kind of cliff of, oh, I'm not good enough, or I you know, when you, when you compare yourself to the startups that are being written in, in the media, and then you're like, wait, what, why am, why are we not raising money or why are we not there? And it's just very easy to compare yourself and then get down on yourself. So, yeah, I mean, I think in general, um, I think it, I would assume it's more prevalent than we think. Yeah. I know in the military, uh, you know, in the, in the military, they, they do a better job of trying to get people to admit they're depressed, whatever. But the thing in the military, I think it's kind of the startups too. Like if you're in the military, you better go to Florida, go to Afghanistan, whatever the case may be. You train for a year for this, right? And then if you, if you, and this is me speaking my own opinion, if you go to say, hey, I'm Jason Cabinets, I can't do this because I'm, I'm not mentally prepared, I'm depressed. They're, they're going to say, okay, that's fine. Go back and stay. However, comma, that means someone has to go in your place who wasn't prepared to go. That's going to be a career killer for your career because those jobs and all we have to do, like, yeah. you know, you have to do these certain jobs, you have to deploy and do these certain things. So you don't get this top notch job. You have to do some, some, I won't say bullshit job, but a regular job. Right. And so all these things on written, right. You can say, no, you're not going to go. You're depressed. However, calm, these are consequences. And so no one does it. At least not a no, right. Everyone like quote unquote sucks it up. Right. Yeah. And take them to, to up in a row. I'm thinking, and like, this, this is me being negative. Like if you're a startup founder, you can feel depressed. You're about to pitch. You're about to do fundraising. Right. Are you really going to tell an investor, hey, I'm not feeling right? Because like an investor has to choose between someone depressed and going to the mental stuff and someone's like a hard charger. Yeah. Like who are they going to pick, right? Is, is that fair, unfair? Like is that, I mean. Yeah. And so I think the way to deal with it is that accept that that is part of life. And, and whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an executive or, you know, doing whatever, you know, like it, it's part of life. And what you're pointing out is, how do we manage through that, you know, and, and I, I'm even, you know, going through right now with, um, you know, some transitions, changes, um, we can talk about my travel and all that. But, um, you know, again, like, these are not, you know, you go back and you're like, you know, was I forced into choosing entrepreneurship? No. So this is our choice. Um, you know, you, you're choosing the more difficult road. So we need to be able to, we have to manage it. We have to um, uh, work through it and, and grow as human beings. I think that's the key. And so, you know, when you think about depression and you think about being down, typically it's because you had an expectation of something that then didn't go that way where, you know, okay, the expectation was, 
we were going to go raise some millions of dollars from investment and did that maybe didn't happen, or we're going to land this big customer that didn't happen, or we're going to just be a rocket ship unicorn that didn't happen. Okay. What do you do now? And, and that's the 99% of all of us out there. And so I think that that's part of the solution is how do you work through it and live through it? And that's what I'm starting to, you know, I talk with, I have coaches that I talk with uh, therapists. Um, I mean, there's three coaches around me in various, you know, positions. Um, some of them are therapists. Some of them are more business coaches. Um, but bringing the right people around me, uh, helping me see things and understand things that maybe I'm not looking at. Because I think the third thing here is, um, and this is something that I struggle with, is uh, and you end up having a very narrow-minded view of things. So um, a good way to explain it is if you take... Oh, I heard someone on a podcast. Um, if you look at this, I'm holding a coffee cup up. If you look at this coffee mug and you look at it straight, like straight on, that shape is actually a rectangle. But if someone looks at it from directly above, it's a circle. And, and so two people could be looking at the same object and be like, no, that's a circle. And someone's like, no, that's a rectangle. And they're both correct. And so when you look at the, the way that you view life, sometimes you might be looking at it as a rectangle. And quite frankly, you need to look at it and see the circle. Yes. So that's, that's what I'm starting to do. It's not easy, but starting to open my mind a little bit more on how I want to live life, how I want to lead as the CEO of Founders Live, how I want to grow the thing I'm growing but also like understand that there's other dynamics in, in my life that I need to pay attention to. So I don't know, there's a lot there we can go deeper, but I think that just understanding perspective and when you're a hard charging entrepreneur, sometimes you're only looking at the rectangle. Like it's a rectangle, it's a rectangle, it's a rectangle. Yeah. And for those of you who are like depressed and you down yourselves and going through things, I mean, there's plenty of resources to reach out to, but nothing else, reach out to your closest friends and family. Like, odds are they probably don't know what you're going through until you tell them, though. So, you know, be just be upfront and honest with them. Exactly. You know, um, yeah, just, you know, be more open with the people around you, whether that's other founder friends, um, family. They may or may not understand. You know, it's, 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 it's a, if, if your family is not, really oriented around the startup world and entrepreneurship, they tend to not fully understand. And so you can talk with them and hopefully they're supportive, but we have other founder friends and we have groups and communities and things like bunker labs, things like founders live that we all kind of at least understand the, the language that we're speaking. So you said you had around three coaches. Talk about the importance of having coaches, no matter what a level of success you're at. Yeah. A lot of people think you, know, you need a coach to start out, but a lot of big time entrepreneurs, big time CEOs have coaches at the highest level. Let's talk about the importance of that. It is tremendously important to have um, people around you that, and, and, you know, this is not like a mentor or an advisor. I mean, I, you know, I pay them. This is their job, their profession. Uh, they are at the top of their, you know, their game. And um, so for me, I, you know, purposely, but randomly, it just turned out there's now three, but I brought these people around me that um, can really help me see the greatness in myself. That, and I think that that's the difference between a mentor. You know, if you go find advisors, mentors, which that's a good idea. And I would suggest people do that. I definitely work with other entrepreneurs as well in that fashion, but they're just, you know, that might be a conversation every month or two that might, you know, they're going to nudge you one way or another, but coaches and therapists challenge you as an individual, as a person and a spirit to find your greatest self. And I think that if someone allows themselves to be challenged and like a lot of questions are asked that then you internally are searching for those answers, they, they really are just asking questions. They're not telling you who you are. They're asking you questions so you can learn and discover who you are. Uh, makes not only a better person, but from a leadership standpoint, it helps me fully develop myself and grow myself as a leader. So how do you find these coaches that were you like looking for coaches or like, did you get like hundreds of coaches reaching out to you? Hey, pick me. I want to be a coach. Talk, uh, talk about that process. Yeah, 
I mean, I do have a number of people reach out to me because of Founders Live, and I, I just encourage them to know that we have a community. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of people, of, of entrepreneurs that could use their services. But um, I would say over, geez, um, so my business coach, I actually connected with him. It was a random mutual introduction, but that was like the big, so the moment I transitioned from Feature Friday to Founders Live, I actually met him and we started working together and he helped actually, he's the one that helped me with, um, he asked me the question about the core values, which we can talk about, but, um, you know, we just randomly met and, uh, I wanted, <laughs> I actually would, I pitched him on sponsoring. Like, I was like, Oh, you, cause he was like an accountant and now he's, he's developed his coaching business as a, a scaling. Uh, it's really about scale and, you know, basically he's a scaling coach and, um, around, you know, processes and strategies around growth and scaling. And I was like trying to like sell him on being a sponsor. And it turned out he's like, look, you know, let's, I, I got a bigger picture here. And he started to like bring me on as, as a client. And so he's awesome. Cause he's much more, it's numbers, it's metrics, it's it, no BS, you know, what are we doing? And then uh, the, the other, so the next one was actually more of a therapist and a individual that is much more rooted in, um, psychotherapy and, um, you know, helps me with really growing in that direction of, um, you know, understanding myself. And, you know, the first time I sat down and, and this was before pandemic, but, um, when I sat down in his chair, he's like, look, you are one of the 3% because you're sitting in this chair right now. Like that means the 3% of our population that actually even chooses to go down the road of, of growth and personal growth and spiritual growth and challenging themselves. And, you know, he's like, there's some powerful people that have sat in that chair. So, you know, realizing that, wow, okay, this person, like I call it, he's like my Yoda. And he, he, he really challenges me to understand the full fundamentals of, of, of human life as well as like spiritual life. So he's, he's great. And then I have a third one, this woman I actually met when I was traveling into Boston. Uh, this was 2019 when I, when I spent time in Boston and, you know, it was just one of those, she knew um, she'd actually like attended a founders live. She knew I was coming in town. We ended up, she, she like wanted to schedule some time and talk. And, you know, just after a hour's worth of meeting and talking, you know, she let me know, like, hey, I, I work with significant leaders and CEOs. And I just was like, okay, I, this is someone that I need to be around. And, and she, similar to the other therapist, like, she is kind of this, like, um, you know, more of a, a, an executive coach, like a CEO coach uh, that really helps me see the things that I'm, again, like, helps me see the circle rather than the rectangle. And we all need that. And, and she just brings the best out of me. So, yeah. So let's get a little more personal. So a few years ago, you do a future Friday that's going well. And we'll talk more details later, but two or three years ago, you were in a relationship with someone It kind of broke off you, and then you decided like to go all out with Founders Live, travel the world, like go all in on Founders Live. Yeah. So talk about that process, how like something, sometimes a negative can turn into like yeah. a very positive thing. Yeah. So for everyone listening, I, yeah, I, I basically I started a relationship and started Founders Live from the beginning at the same time, like it was pretty much the same month. And so those two grew and it went from Feature Friday to Founders Live. And all of a sudden it's like in many cities, uh, you know, I think what things changed when I even just saw a video of the, the event, like in Africa. And I was like, oh, this might be big. Okay. Something's going on here. And so, you know, we, as a relationship, we were really tracking well, and then it just kind of like the relationship was going one way and my life was going another and, you know, with the business. And so long story short, it just didn't work out. And, you know, she's great, but it didn't work out. And so we were breaking we were splitting up like the holiday season. It was like 20, 2018. Can, can you, you did a blog post on this, didn't you? I did. Okay. I, it was tough, man. It's one of the hardest things I've gone through. And so I'm like, okay, this is happening. And what, what am I going to do? And, you know, I had this insight. I actually, so the story is that we were breaking up and I was like needing to move out. So 
there was an event in Portland. I actually ride the Bolt bus down, which I think they actually shut down, which is too bad from the pandemic. But Bolt bus was nice because you could just like, like well, cheap money, like a dollar, five dollars. It was crazy. very cheap, very cheap Wi-Fi. And for like a Seattle to Portland, like all of a sudden I would just sit down, start working. And all of a sudden you're like in Portland a couple hours later. So I love doing that. I would go down there. Um, so I went down there. It was December, like early December. And I was like, I need to get out of the city. I went down there, got an Airbnb for a couple of days, had our event. And it was like refreshing. And on the way back up, I just had this insight. I said, well, if I'm going to move out what if I just did this for like a longer time? And what if I just set up this tour and set up this way to go around the world, stay in Founders Life cities and attend our events and live on the road and have a good time. And I literally mapped out on a Google doc. I just was like, I literally remember writing. I was like, okay, what, what, what if I just stayed in all these cities? And I started listing out the cities and I started to map out the tour. And I was like, I am going to put my stuff in storage. I am going to figure it out and I'm going to go tour the world and live in Founders Life cities. And so I created that blog post. It was, you know, emotional in a way. And I announced like, hey, you know, like this is what, what happened and here's where I'm going. And I announced the the tour and I literally put all my stuff in storage, hit the road. Jan basically the around Christmas time, I went um went down with family into Idaho. And that's really where I started, started the tour. Um, it was really special because the January month I was in Boise, Idaho, where my dad at the time, he was still alive. He was living, you know, my dad had cancer for three years and he ended up uh, passing away um, mid 2019. But I was able to spend a month with my father in a city. Like I hadn't spent a month in, a whole full month in, in a city with my, my dad. So that was awesome. And then, um, yeah, just, I traveled about 70, actually 75,000 miles through that 2019 year. And, um, I can tell you even m much more around the, the experiences, but, um, was on four continents, you know, went through, uh, UK, went through, uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa and in, on the continent of Africa and went down to South America and Argentina. And it was just, it was the coolest time. And so, yeah, I mean, the lesson here is, look, you can take any Nate, not great, negative, whatever you want to call it, sad time, and you can flip it around and, and create some really interesting and amazing memories. When you were traveling, like, did you like um, document anything? Like, did you do any content creation? Like, do any video blogs or anything about your travels? So, in in short, I took you know I took a lot of pictures and 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 I you know I think you probably you know I would push out a um, kind of a monthly review. I mean, basically, like every month, I would push out a little uh, written overview and and all that. But you know, many people were like, "Why why aren't you not like you know?" I wasn't posting on Instagram a lot and you know, I wasn't like documenting it. And the reason why is man, like, look, <clears throat> I'm, I'm much more in the moment and present than like, Oh, I need to need to fire up Instagram and record this and, you know, stream it. And I just, it's just not my thing. I don't know why I don't know. I, I just don't know why, like I choose to uh, more pay attention in the moment than, than time out and take a picture or stream this via Instagram or TikTok or whatever. So I didn't fully document like I wanted to. Um, it's just, you know, if maybe if there was a friend or maybe if I had literally a videographer, um, which we we've been looking at, you know, creating a show around something like this, uh, we can talk about that. But if I had a team, I mean, look, Gary Vaynerchuk, come on. Yeah. He's got a team of like 15 or 20 people. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not possible. It's like as an individual, no. it's hard. So you know, I chose to, I actually chose to fully experience the, the whole entire thing as a person versus like trying to take all these pictures and capture all this video that you're probably not going to watch again, you know? So I don't know, you know, if I would, I, it would be nice to go back. If I look, if I was, if this was December, 2018 and I knew like, I knew what I knew now, <laughs> I probably would have put a little more intent on 
putting together a system that I would, and a, you know, an approach to how I'd travel, but um, yeah, I can do that later. So any travel tips for everyone? Like, did you like use like Google flights or oh, like Airbnbs? Or how do you yeah. plan all this stuff out? And like, how do you know where to stay oh, at? Oh man, um, I do, I do. So for everyone, you know, I basically I was, I was, I've been on the road for two and a half years. Um, I now just got settled in Seattle again, you know, for, for a short period or a longer period of time, but fairly, you know, it might be a six months or a year, but, um, I stayed in 700 plus nights of Airbnbs. Um, I traveled probably 130 to 150,000 miles. Um, so many flights, um, a lot of, even, you know, right in driving on the road, like, I personally didn't drive, but I connected with a friend and we spent about two and a half months like in his, like, uh, it was a bus that he had renovated to this like kind of RV and we drove around the Southwest. It was just amazing. So like literally driving on highways and it had like Wi-Fi, And so I'd be sitting back there working and he's like driving it. And so, so fun, but yeah, I would, you know, first off, um, you know, when you book Airbnbs on a monthly, they're a lot cheaper per night. So, you know, by scheduling your trap, like when I started looking at like, cause I would do like two or three weeks in a city, but then if you start piecing together quote nightly on Airbnb, it's all, it's much more expensive. If you do a chunk of time, longer period of time, the nightly fee on average goes way down. So it's much more affordable if you're going monthly th- into a place and, and staying at one place. Um, I would you know, I would search, um, the city. So for instance, like Chicago or Atlanta or DC, I would literally, before I'm going to go there, you search it like save us neighborhoods. You end up finding these heat maps of the city and I, of the neighborhoods, like they will like, um, you know, violence or not, or whatever it's how safe is it. And so I would then, you know, cross-reference that with, you pull up on, um, on Airbnb, like what's available. And then on Airbnb, you can, um, there's, there's ways to go much deeper to search and find, like when you search on Airbnb, the first thing that pops up in terms of like the 20 or 30 or 50 or whatever, there's many, many more than that. You have to continue to search and re like actually like zero in on the, on the map, change the uh, criteria of the search. They will surface more things. Okay. So you got to take a little more time to search that. And then I would compare and be like, okay, this is the area of the city I want to stay in. And you just got to like, keep looking. Right. And the thing with Airbnb too, is every day those change because people grab the, you know, they're taking the ones that are available, but then some other ones might, someone might list it the next day and open it up. So, um, you got to check every day, you know, um, you got to get on it. So I would, then I would find one, um, and I, I would like have two or three in ta- like two or three tabs and I'd have like the top two or three. And then I actually would sit on them for a night. And even though like you want to make it the choice quickly, I would actually be like, I would kind of let it simmer and be like, okay, wait, of these two, which one do I want? And, and then just kind of sit on it and almost like meditate a little bit and wake up the next morning. And if it's still available, I get it, you know, boom, you know? And um, so for instance, a good example is I was in, I was in New Orleans the entire month of April and it was awesome. It was first time in New Orleans actually. And, um, my gosh, like before I went there, I had two, there was these two options, one of them. And again, like I'd never been in New Orleans, so I didn't really know like, okay, like another thing is like the scale of the map. So if you've never been to a city and you're looking at like, okay, I want to be close to downtown. I want to be close to blah, blah, blah. But, you have this place over here and this place over here. You don't realize like, okay, that might be like a long car ride. You know, the scale of the map might be a bit different. Um, but it turns out I was looking at one that was literally like 10 or 15 minutes outside the city, like, like an Uber ride. And then there was one where I was like, it's not in exactly the quote best neighborhood, but it was literally right outside the French Quarter. And I just kind of was like, and, and it was more expensive. And this one outside of the city was a little less expensive. And I was like sitting there. And then the next day they're still available. And I finally was like, dude, I'm going with the one down, like in, in the city, like close to the, the French quarter. 
And it was one of those where I was so happy. Like every single, like it was the coolest place. French Quarter is amazing, you know, Bourbon Street and all that. But like, I literally was like a 10, five to 10 minute walk right into the, the best area of New Orleans. Um, I went on runs all the time around the city and I was just so thankful that I chose. And it was just like one of those like gut intuition feelings. You know, I was like, I did not take the cheapest one. I took the one that was located in, in a better like relation to the city, but it was actually a little more dangerous of a neighborhood. But if I would have taken that other one, I wouldn't, if, I wouldn't have gone downtown as much. I wouldn't have been in the French Quarter as much. And I would have had to take an Uber every time I wanted to go somewhere. So when you look at that, like when you start traveling, you learn these little things of the areas of the city you want to stay in, the how did, you know, Uber, Google Maps, Airbnb, those three things, like that's what I lived on. There's no way I could have done what I've done 10, 15, 20 years ago. Is there a city you went to like kind of surprised you like how great it was to be there? Oh yeah. I mean, there's so many, um, Cape town is okay. Cape town, South Africa is the one that I, I, when people ask me that it's beautiful, it's it, Cape town is the coolest city. I mean, it's, I mean, it's South Africa and they've had their issues and, um, you, you sense that it's pretty interesting. The, the, the range of, of humans and people there and, you know, their history is just struggling for sure, but it's beautiful. And it basically, it's a tip of the end, the bottom of um, South Africa. It's on the coast. There's a huge, they call it Table Mountain. It's a huge, like, it's basically like a, a semi-circle mountain that encaves the city. And then it's, it's at this, like, the tip. So, like, you can go around it, and then now you're on the coast, and the most beautiful homes you've ever seen overlooking the ocean and uh, green, it's beautiful. And um, the city is basically, it's like in this really interesting mountain range that, you know, it's both coastal, but there's also like, there's just this dynamic um, environment and um, it was beautiful. And it's also like, it's very metro. Cape Town is, when you're in Africa, you're, you have a wide range of experiences. And when you're in Cape town, I mean, you can pull out your phone and find a coffee shop right down the street. And that's not necessarily the case in like Ferrari, Zimbabwe. So Cape town, you is, as an American, you feel a little more, you know, at home versus, you know, some other places of the country. Can you talk about this? Some, like, I think America, we think we're like number one tech country in the world. Everything's fast and it speeds. Can you talk about how actually other countries actually like kind of more high tech advanced than we are? Well, I mean, so in some senses, I mean, depending on, look, I, I haven't been to like Singapore yet and I'm sure it's um, pretty amazing there, but we, for instance, Africa. So I go into Zimbabwe and, you know, one thing when you travel and especially internationally, other continents, first of all, you land and your phone doesn't work. You have to get a SIM card. Well, let, let me rephrase that. <laughs> Verizon or AT&T or T-Mobile want you to not do this and they want you to pay like, it would have been like three or $400 a month for me to use my phone um, if I wouldn't have got a SIM card. But basically when you land somewhere, if you want to use their network, you have to get a SIM card that then works with like that local, like, um, you know, service. So cell service. So, you know, you got to get that connectivity and that SIM card and then their payment system is majority mobile, which is so ironic that you basically pay with a message on your phone. This is what I was working on. This was the second was like in 2010, 2011. So in 2019 and 2020, EcoCash or there's M-Pesa and there's other things over in Africa. Dude, you buy your groceries and all of a sudden you have a message on your phone and you just like, okay it. And you're, you're, your money is digital through your cell service. And you over there, you basically either have kind of an unlimited where it's like attached to your bank and it's, then it's paying through the mobile or you just re ups, so you buy credits. So I had to go and, you know, it took three or four days to like get all that set up. So like I had to like borrow money from the people down there and it's like, okay, Hey, can you can buy my food or whatever? But once you get set up now you're, you're paying. So everything is mobile there. Like it's amazing. And 
you know, they're not pulling out credit cards and swiping it at the grocery store to get, they literally like, or there's a number, there's always like a, there's like a long code number and you just pull out and it's like an app on your phone, but it's actually t tied into um, the SMS messaging system. And you just type these numbers in and you pay. And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> so it, it, it feels, I mean, you're in this like developing country. They have some things that we have and some things that we, do, that they don't have, but they're literally transacting all this all over with your phone. It was like really amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So from all your dreams around the world, have you found that entrepreneurship is the same everywhere? Entrepreneurs have the same characteristics or is entrepreneurship different based on location? Yeah. Um, look, in, in general, entrepreneurship is pretty much the same, which is beautiful. And I think that when you, you know, for instance, you know, meeting people in Africa, you know, so this is like, you know, when I was there, they, they basically said, Hey, um, if you would like, or if you're willing to, uh, open up your calendar, you know, we can kind of fill it with some people that want to ask you stuff like kind of mentorship and advisory. So I met with these people and one of these guys, it was this one guy that I remember, you know, he, he was asking me questions. He basically was like, how, how can we be like you? And I, I was just like, what does he mean by that? And what he meant was like, how, like he is a founder and entrepreneur as well. All he wants to do is build his company and be successful, just like me and you, you know, and he's just in Harare, Zimbabwe. It's, there's no difference, right? And so number one, I, it just really was striking that we all are just relatively in different environments. Maybe the, the amount of money and dollars that we're talking about is an order of magnitude smaller, but it does not change that they want to make impact and they want to create value and, and they want to build business. And, and, you know, um, so, you know, he, his question was amazing because he's looking at me like I'm this like crazy successful, like, you know, entrepreneur that has built something all around the world. And, you know, of course, like we are, but you know, I still got a long ways to go, but what it told me was entrepreneurship is a human desire. It's not an American thing. It's, it's not a U.S. based thing. Entrepreneurship is all over the world, everywhere. And that, that's really why Founders Live is that the heart of it is to, to bring change to the world globally, not just the United States, and, and to help people move forward and build what they want to build, create what they want to create. Um, so I think the differences, the differences is really around, um, I think, information. You know, I think um, the the way that we are, the way that we think and the information that we're provided and, you know, the access to um, education and, you know, uh, look, our industry, the way I learn is through reading and listening and, um, you know, whether it's podcasts, articles, access to information, things like, um, you know, and for instance, PitchBook, you know, PitchBook is great here. They're from actually from Seattle and, you know, I get the, their emails every day that gives you insight into our industry so when you look at the companies and organizations that are bringing intelligence and information disseminating it to us and you're able to open an email and read it every day being around that and then coming here and obviously with you know the pandemic has been tough but you know the co-working spaces and events and all of a sudden the energy brings you intelligence and, and information that helps you build a company. You look at other countries that might not be as prevalent. That's why they might, that's why his question was, how are we, how can we be like you? It's, I think it's more like, how can, how can we start having more of those things and access to information and, um, and then, you know, more investors and capital flowing through, then they're going to be able to, you know, build what, what they want to build and, and, and be more like us which doesn't mean more like Americans, just means, you know, better access to information, education, uh, capital, then success follows. So what's your opinion on this? This was on a, this, uh, um, discussion on core a little while ago. The discussion was like, you know, if you took, make everyone a blank slate, I gave you everyone $25,000 and equal access to everything. Would the successful people still be successful? Like would Dave Bezos still be Dave Bezos? 
with Tim Cook, still be Chief Cook, Gary Vanger, Gary Vaynerchuk, or by making the state clean, would everything be equal? Well, my my quick answer to that is, I don't think so because if if the rules of the game are Gary knows what he knows, Jeff knows what he knows and who he knows, he'll take that twenty five and you know turn it into a million. And that's like ninety five percent of the people on the on the yeah. discussion pretty much said the same thing. So, but my thoughts here are let's reverse that. And if, if the clean slate is more like if, if you removed the access of, well, this is why community and, and network is so important. That's the, I think that that, that in the end, that's the key is the network that they've already built. And then, you know, the access to information or, or systems or whatever intelligence that they have. And if you take someone like this, this guy in Zimbabwe and you give him $25,000, and then you compare that to someone here that has a different network and, you know, different access. Of course, the, someone here is going to accelerate, you know? Um, so I think that, that that's part of the answer is, um, look, I think, I think the hustle and the desire is going to be much more in the person that doesn't have, in, in my opinion. Um, what they do with less money is absolutely in, incredible um you know so if you took bezos and stripped his connections and all his money i don't know what would he would he hustle as much as the people that are doing that every day i don't know and and i'm not i'm not knocking him at all but um i think it's impressive of so what i've seen around the world it's impressive of what these people have done with lack lack of the capital or not as much access to capital or network that maybe people do here in the United States. So Nick, how do you on a daily basis find your inspiration? Well, you know, um, actually, ironically, I don't know if this is I ironic or not, but, um, you know, it's actually, it's the community. So what inspires me more is the stories that come out of the early stage entrepreneurs that we have around um, the people that are maybe earlier in their journey than me and to see them still light, lit up and to see them drive hard keeps me going because it takes me back a little bit to that time of getting started. Secondly, um, it, you know, that's who I serve and that's who we serve. And so to see more people, earlier on that are inspired and wanting to build their company that keeps me going in times that are challenging um, versus like, Oh, like I'm going to like listen to this, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or Bezos, like, you know, I'll go onto YouTube and you know, uh, there's some Bezos interviews that I think are great. I, you know, I think um, I actually really like to search old Steve jobs interviews actually. Um, I think he was very insightful. Like I'm talking about in like eighties and nineties. Um, but I'm much more inspired by seeing people in, in the fight in like early, early stage, you know? So that inspires me. And then, um, you know, at times of challenge it realizing that, and look, it's all right here. Anything is possible. And, um, you know, sometimes when I'm down on myself, I kind of step back and I'm like, dude, I, I did. I traveled all around the world, man. Like, you know, like I've seen and met these people and it's beautiful. And, you know, I think in 2017, if, if I would have heard the story of like some guy, you know, a breakup happened and he puts his stuff in storage and travels around the world. Like I've been like, that's crazy. That's TV show material, right? Yeah. There. Like I want to meet this guy. So, um, all it took was an idea and, and, and then determination. And, so that's what inspires me as well as I, I think that there's so much more out there, not just for me, for everyone, but we got to, you got to believe. And sometimes it's hard, you know? So Nick, obviously you never tell an entrepreneur not to follow a dream or the business idea is like off the wall crazy. But what do you do in those times? Like, you're like, okay, I don't get this idea. Like suppose someone said, Hey, I want to sell snow cones <laughs> in, um, um, Homer, Alaska in January. Right. Yeah. Like how do you, what's your advice for them? How do you deal with those things? Oh, um, well, 
So the first thing, a little caveat on this, which I've learned with Founders Live, um, we're all over the world and you know, on a daily and weekly basis. So we have a system that, you know, when companies are going to pitch, they fill out that we have a form and, and basically we intake. So we have just like, we have a, there's like, theoretically, there's this bucket that just keeps filling with startups and ideas from all around the world. And I see these come through and I'm like, okay, there are a lot of them. I'm like, wow, that's, that's awesome. It's really cool. It's, it's cool to see these things, but some of them just like, I don't really see it and I don't get it. Ideas and concepts are relative to an environment or a community. So that's number one is like, look, who am I to say that this idea or this startup concept from, from Nairobi or from, you know, Jakarta is a bad idea. Uh, there's no reason that I can say that's a bad idea or not, because I can't like, these are people in their communities that maybe they see a need. So I think that's the big thing is, um, is there a problem and a need in their either city, their country, their region of the world that they can solve? Because maybe I don't know it. Maybe I don't see it. Um, so I think ideas are relative. Uh, and then, you know, you just got to ask the person like, okay, wh what kind of customer development have you done? Where, where is your data around there is a problem and then you can solve it? Or another way to think about this for people out there is like, how are people, you, what are people doing now to solve that problem that maybe is just hacking together a couple, you know, software products or whatever, and you can just build the one. So what are people like, are they using Google, you know, like Google docs for something that you, for instance, like notions, a good example, right? Like back in the day before notion and all that, like maybe people are just piecing together Google stuff, Google docs, and they figured out a way to do a collaborative thing, much, much more uh, integrated. So good example, you know, so I, I think I would challenge that entrepreneur to show me why they think that this idea is relevant and going to be successful based on some data and examples of people either struggling with things or piecing together things that they think that they could do it better, you know? Um, so I've learned through thousands of pitches, I'm not going to squash people's ideas because those are going to change anyway. But is it, what's the market? What's the problem? Where is the opportunity? Trying to get some intelligence out that way. So Nick, next talk about the importance of believing yourself and creating value. Mm -hmm. Well, look, if you don't believe in yourself, nothing's going to happen. Um, that, that's number one. And um, again, like, let's go back to a bit of even the emotion, the depression. Um, that's where the disconnect can be. And, you know, when you struggle and you have challenges and look, not every day is going to be awesome. Even for me, like, I think that that's, you know, when I have challenging times, sometimes I step back and I'm like, okay, Nick, just it's a, there's seasons to this whole thing. And not every day is just going to be a walk in the meadow and see the flowers and blah, 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 you know, whatever that analogy is. So um, tough times are going to happen. And the key is believing in yourself that you can move through that time and, and you can get to the next, like, get, you know, get through the tough times, but know that you're going to progress into a, a new place. And um, I think if you lose that, not just as an entrepreneur, but as a human, but if you lose that grip on believing in yourself, then you're not in a good place. And, and you're gonna, you're, you're, you're losing the one thing that is required to be a successful individual, which is the belief that you can actually do it. So I think it's, it's the most important thing. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, secondly, it's when there's belief, then there's confidence in, in, in yourself. And confidence is this like energetic, spiritual thing. It emotes out of you as an individual, as a person. And that's what starts to influence and affect the others around you, right? So confidence is required to go be successful 
in whatever endeavor you're, 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 you're doing. And um, so I think the belief is the foundation in yourself, knowing that you can go do great things, but then confidence is built and then people are inspired by you. And then they're like, okay, there's something in that person. I want to be around. There's some, I'm going to, I believe in them because they have confidence in themselves. Right. So that's what ties it together. So next, let's talk about your sales experience. So basic question, is the difference between sales and business development, is that the same thing? What, what are those two definitions? Look, the difference from my standpoint, you know, there's sales within business development activities, but business development can flow into more around, you know, kind of like partnerships, um, you know, um, how are we going to, how are we going to move our organization forward through, you know, uh, associated partnerships, working together with other organizations? That, that's a, kind of a big thing with Founders Live is, you know, we have a number of um, partnerships, sponsorships, um, big, large organizations that we work with more closely. It might be a financial relationship. It might be they provide, you know, for instance, like AWS, you know, they provide um, great credits and other things. But um business development is really around how to work with other organizations and it could involve sales. Sales is you got a pipeline, you have a product or service and you go find the customer that is looking for it and, and you, you end up closing that sale. And there's many different processes and directions to do that. Um, I would say that I'm not the expert. I'm good, good enough. Um, and I think as a CEO, you need to, it, in some way, shape or form, you need to be able to close a sale. Like that's the bottom line. You are the first salesman in your company. Um, that, that's just the, the fact. But there, you also are working on business development, which basically means creating that pipeline. So how do you, how do you actually even create a system to fill the pipeline of possible partnerships, possible clients and customers? that you then go through that sales process and actually close the sale. So um, I would say the last thing on this that, that basically is involved with both is one of the keys to sales and business development is seeing things from their shoes. So maybe the inherent obvious question is why would they buy or purchase from you? So they have needs, they have, um, they have things that they need, they need to accomplish. They have a business to run on their side. So what is it that we as an organization or you as a company offer to help them solve their problem? And so by learning about their business and, and basically seeing things from their shoes, you can then be able to offer a solution and essentially close a sale. So that part of sales is to see things from their point of view and, you know, playing that role, like you got to role play and then understand both sides again, rectangle circle. And, and then be that, that helps close the sale because now you can, you know, understand what they're in and their language. So Nick, for you personally and, and advice to other CEOs, like, you know, they say a lot, a lot of people would say sales is the most important marketing, most important tech development, all these things are the most important. Yeah. Obviously, they can all be, you got to do to prioritize. How do you on day-to-day day know how to like focus on one to four versus 100 to 125? Yeah. Well, look, you know, I do, you know, I think Cuban said it, but, you know, sales, sales, live and, you live and die by sales. And, and again, like depending on what your business is and your product will determine that specific, you know, orientation, but, you know, you're not driving sales. You're, you're, you're not in heading in the right direction in one. If you're not generating revenue and profit, you're not heading in the right direction. That's number one. Um, but I'm going to switch it. I'm going to actually say the thing I've learned with founders live is I think before sales, the first phase of, or the, one of the first important phases of, growing a, a company is actually creating the brand. So what does the brand actually represent? This comes back to the core values, you know? So let's go back. So 
Dale, who was, you know, he, he asked me the question. He's my growth scaling coach. He, in a WeWork, um, the WeWork in downtown Seattle that we very early in, very early in the founders live experience, we would have events in that downstairs. Um, I think that the Holy Oak building. Right? Yep. And I remember that's probably where we met. Yep. And I remember that's where Christine and I met as well. I believe so many memories there, but um, we were in one of those meeting rooms and, and Dale asked me the questions around what's important. Um, what, what is important to you? And what then as the founder and CEO, it becomes what, what absolutely matters to the company? What would you like fire a customer over if they crossed these things? Turns out that ends up being your core values. So when you create these things that the company and you as a founder care about as much as deeply as, you know, breathing, it turns out that you format that your what comes out of that is the, the brand of the company. And I can tell you, it's probably the best thing I've ever done is to create incredibly strong core values that then have wrapped into this global thing that becomes the brand of Founders Live. And brand and what it means and the purpose, if you do that first, then sales can start to happen a little easier because then your customers know what you stand for and they know what they can get. I'm using air quotes. They, what do they get out of this? Whether it's the product, but it's the association with this brand or this CEO or this founder and this team, right? So I'm just kind of taking a long road to say, focus on your core values. Focus on what's important to your company. And once you put those together and you're actually talking about them externally, all of a sudden the market's like, oh, like there's a meaning behind this company. We want to work with them. We want to purchase from them. We want to use their product or service. And all of a sudden it's a little easier now to then drive, drive that sales. So I think, you know, focus on core values and then, and then build that foundation. And then you'll know what your top three or four priorities are as you go forward running your company. Can you talk about your core values for your founder's life and what the process come yeah. up with those? So there's literally thousands of core values you can pick from, right? Yeah. Why do you pick the ones you picked? Yeah. So the, uh, the core values are, uh, first one is what we say is respectful authenticity, but that's really around, um, entrepreneurial quality now. And what that means is everyone, no matter what they look like, how they talk, where they grew up, what their orientation is, they absolutely deserve access to success um, and access to the community. So being respectful of people's individual differences. Number two is gather around the campfire. That really is about storytelling and, and actually community. So the two things, and I use campfire as like, it's almost like ancestrally, like, you know, you go back and stories were told around campfires and villages and all that. And they literally were telling stories of the future. That's what we're doing with Founders Live. And so, you know, if figuring out how to tell your story as well as gathering as a community, you know, that's really became that core value and what's important to us. Third is open the door. And that's just about doing great things for people, making introductions, um, helping them, basically passing it on and, and just do great things for people and without expecting to, to be paid or a return. Because you do that outwardly, it comes back to you, Matt, just so much multi-fold. Um, and, and last one is uh, what we say is no name tags, but really it's just around have fun. And, you know, I think business should be fun. It should be casual. It should be um, uh, enjoyable, not so stiff and awkward, you know? So um, when you look at those core values, like, again, Dale, through a process of asking questions, those things came out. Like, number one is be respectful and everyone has equal opportunity for success. That's like hugely important to me. Number two, community. Number three, just treat people well and do great things. What's the problem with that? Four, let's just have fun. So 
through conversation, those came out and we just wrote them down. And then it was like, okay, next, next exercise is how do you, how do you wrap those into the brand experience? And so that's, that's where like the event, that's why we start talking about them. And that's why like you outwardly say, this is what we're about. Cause then people will start to act that way. So if we stand up in front of hundreds of people and say, our first core, like our core values are about entrepreneurial quality and re being respectful of everyone. What do you think the, the general activities are going to be around that? So by not saying it, you're allowing some maybe things to happen. And by saying it, you're illustrating, this is our core values. We expect the community to respect them and adopt them. So the people who run your, your city, Brown of Live, what are, the, what are they called? Like uh, volunteers, directors? We call them city leaders. City leaders. So you're in a lot of cities. How do you make sure all these city leaders are like supporting your core values? We have a playbook, um, an internal playbook that illustrates like everything to do. Um, but honestly, you know, it, I mean, we have like monthly calls to, as you know, touch base on things and update them with what's going on. And, but I really think the, in general, the, again, it's like we, we talk about it at the events, but you know, that's kind of what we lead with when we're looking to onboard city leaders, like the, they either attract, they're attracted to this, the, the core values and all that. It's a part of the game. It's like, wow, this organization is interesting and different, unique. That's why one of the reasons why they're attracted to it. So inherently they adopt them and they really enjoy them. Um, but obviously like our events are live streamed and you know, the, essentially it's like, look, if, 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 if they're not adhering to these core values, then it's going to be pretty obvious. And then they're just going to kind of, they're going to leave. You know, we've had a, we've had people just kind of like shake out and it, not because they're like bad people, but life happens. And so, you know, we've in the process, we've baked in, the fact that like, if they're not fully adopting and adhering to these core values, it's kind of going to be obvious and it's going to be uncomfortable for them, you know? So, um, yeah. So I think part of it is the recruit, they're front and center in the recruiting process. And, you know, people that are attracted to them are going to come out of the woodwork and be like, Oh, Hey, this is cool. So let's say you have a city that needs a city leader, right? And of course you want someone to come on also add value and it'll create community. But what, what would what would you tell to someone enticing to come on and take on that role? Like, what do they get out of it, so to speak? Yeah, the being a city leader for Founders Live um, is is a very honorable experience, and I think if someone takes it seriously, it's one of the best things you could do. From you know building the your, network you can build, you're building your network. So first of all, look. The people you meet, I mean, just your network to have access I to. I mean, let's, let's actually take a step back and realize, like, as a city leader, you are organizing and running. You're the central node of Founders Life in your area. That means if you're having events on a monthly or, you know, for instance, like Amelia here in Seattle, she's doing a great job. The amount of founders that she is connected with just in the last year is, like, amazing, right? So five each month. And you have, let's say, 10 events a year, maybe 11, you know, it's 50, 55, 50 to 55 founders that are building companies that you have no idea what might happen in two, three, five years, but they're going to know that very successful person, you know. Um, so you're building your network of amazing founders. You are establishing your leadership in front of the crowd. People are like, realizing like, wow, this person, okay, they're a leader. That's why we call them city leaders. Um, they're polishing their public speaking skills. Man, that's one of the best things to do. Are, are you, you know, now because we're streaming it all, like, are you comfortable in front of a camera, like streaming, you know, uh, are you comfortable on a stage in front of hundreds of people in person? Um, they are associated with this really cool thing that's happening around the world. Um, obviously working closely with me and, you know, look, we're, we're innovative and we're going to do new things too. And so just being associated with this brand that is pushing the envelope around the world, like, you know, and again, like I don't need to convince people. 
if I have to convince someone to be a city leader, they're not going to be a good city leader. So again, the core values and all that stuff, it's a magnet for the right people. And then they just emerge. And so, you know, we've got amazing city leaders all around the world and, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a blessing to be a part of it. But again, like this is not a paid position, you know, we're, we're working on some things that might end up being really cool in that direction um, going forward. But if this was like a paid position, a couple grand a month, I think the dynamics would be different, you know? Yeah, and and I, I, so I thought that like from day one, I said, no, this is, although it's not easy to lead a volunteer army, it's like better than leading an army that's making a couple grand a month because now they're like, well, I want to raise or give me, give me more money. Mm-hmm. You know, like, and it's not that we don't want to do that, but I'm looking for people that already have the thing in their life and they have a absolute burning desire to make impact around the world, but specifically in their city to help and grow entrepreneurship. You know, can you talk about your take on, um, companies started by founders versus, uh, solo founders? You know, a lot of, you've heard a lot of investment firms or VCs say, yeah. I would never invest in a solo founder, right? Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm a solo, solo founder and yeah, I have a couple of thoughts on this. Number one, it is not a hundred percent required to have a co-founder to start a company. You heard it here. You can start your company. And you know, are you are you solo? You're a solo founder. Yeah. Right. Look. Um, so first of all, if you have a vision and you want to build something and you want to create something, just go do it. Now the key is your team. And so the the kind of bridge you have to cross there, if you're going to be a solo founder, because by the way, it just happens, you know, for me, it was just like founders. I've just started, you know, and I, I wasn't looking around saying I need a co-founder. I just did it. And you have to figure out what, who's your team, how you're going to build the team and how, what's in it for them and how you're going to, how, what's the compensation, what's the reason why they would actually join the team. So I think that that's, that's the next question there um, is around team and, and, and how to, how to form that team if they're not quote co-founders. Um, most investors are going to look for a team. Now, is that a solo founder plus the other people that are involved or is it two or three co-founders? I think that that's a detail that's less important. They're going to want to know though, regardless, like what's the incentive for these people to stay? Like, are they bought in? So when they look at like, when there's a number of co-founders, two or three, they, that at least tells them, okay, like these people have equity. They're going to hopefully be there for a long time because they want to see it out. You know, if you've just hired a CTO and they don't have any equity, they might not stick around. You know, that's the question, right? So I think that that that's in one way, shape or form, you're looking at like, Investors are looking at like, what's the longevity of this team? Who's bought in? Who's, who's, who's going to like, you know, drive as far as they can to be successful. Um, I think on the topic of co-founders, you know, it's like a relationship, if not much more important than in a relationship. And so don't go into it like, oh, I'm just going to find a co-founder this weekend. (laughs) You know, come on. Um, it is important in it. You know, um, I, I next company I start, I will have a co-founder and especially a developer. You know, like I think that that's one thing I've learned is like, okay, look, the next thing I do, specifically if it's involving a product and technology, I'm going to make sure that I do have a, co- a co-founder, a, a team. Because um, it's been, it's a challenging road when you're a solo founder and trying to figure out how to do that without the the team. But I think like, there's inherent challenges. I mean, like you might end up getting, you know, not getting along and what do you do then? So I think that that's uh, everything you need to think about. There's literally equal positives and negatives for, for each side of this conversation. It's just number one, I don't think you're, it's required to start the company. Number two, think about your team who's all needing to be there and involved. Like literally what do you need? And then go find those people, whether they are quote co-founders or, a hired position. 
And number three, you know, what the, what's the long road? And, you know, hopefully you can trust those people to be around for years as you develop your company and you don't want to flake and you don't want now a, what they call a, a, the cap table that's very dirty yeah. or whatever you want to call it. Like there's these people that have been here and they have 30% of the company and they're not here anymore. What's going on? So it's a very, very serious, I think, consideration. Um, but it's personal to each individual. I think one thing entrepreneurs make a mistake of, like they'll bring a little founder, put a the team. And even you make someone like a 50, 50 co-founder, they'll never be as all in as you are. I don't think. Right. I think a lot of people get that wrong. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I definitely agree in the camp of, I don't think it should be 50, 50. Um, there's been a, some amazing podcasts I've listened to recently on this topic of like, I mean, the whole concept of equity is kind of strange that like two or three people come together at a point in time, we're going to create this thing and you're literally divvying up the pie of ownership the moment you meet each other and you have no idea the route and what's going to happen over time and, um, you know, value gets created over time. And in that value, like the question is, what are people bringing to the table? So you know, if no one's kind of bringing any cash and it's everyone's just kind of starting it from scratch and there's really no money involved initially, then you look at like, okay, who's going to be building the thing? So the developer, honestly, like if, if you know, if you're, if you have an idea person and then you have someone that like codes the product and builds it, geez, like the value of that developer is immense. Yes. Yes. So a lot of times though, it's like the idea person, then it, thinks that they should own the most and then the developers should get less when in reality, the only way that this whole thing is going to be brought to market is if it's coded and launched. So, you know, I think that that is a tremendous, it's a tremendous conversation. It takes a lot of honesty and, and openness to, to really have two or three people sit down and look at like, what is, what, what are we doing here and how are we going to like chop this up and, I don't have the answer. It's again, it's, it's, in, it's unique to each team. Um, I think idea people need to realize like your idea kind of is one in a thousand, it's, you know, there's, it's like a diamond dozen. So, um, and then the, the funny thing is then I start and then you run around the tree, run around the tree and all of a sudden you come back to, oh, okay, 33% for three people, you know, it's like, you know, so I think in the end, um, there needs to be a, a really honest conversation between people to really determine like what that equity ownership is initially. It's almost like picking a founder, co-founders are almost like picking a golf team, right? Like you're not going to play golf for eight hours a day with people you don't like, right? Oh, hundred percent. Like you need to have a very, very strong, respectful working relationship. You need to know that it's going to go through ups and downs. Um, these people are going to be there hopefully you can constructively have some challenging conversations so that that you can get through the the crap and then go into great times so it's equal to like a relationship like can you get through can you live with an individual and can you like love them or respect them and also have conversations not fights have conversations that you might see different angles and, and you might literally be on different sides of the conversation. Um, same thing with co-founders. And honestly, they're not great co-founders are great partners and it takes time to establish that relationship and that, that partnership, you know? So off subject a little bit, can you talk about your time with the WNBA? I can. Yeah. Um, little known fact. I, so I graduated, I went to Western Washington University and I graduated with a uh, biomechanics and essentially it's exercise physiology, um, exercise science degree. And I worked with athletes and uh, trained, you know, trained basketball players, trained, you know, football players. And, um, you know, when I realized that I was not going to be the professional athlete, I was going to train them. And so that's what I did. And so actually my, my junior year of college, I ended up getting an internship with, uh, the Sonics and storm. So the Seattle Sonics back in the day when we actually had an NBA team, um, 
for two seasons, I was with them as a strength coach and, and I worked with, um, you know, kind of helped out with the Sonics and then, um, was a strength coach for the storm. That second year, I was actually the head strength coach turned, you know, kind of a timing wise, like the, the head strength coach of the storm ended up getting hired somewhere else. And I, I had that position for a season and, you know, traveled with them and, you know, worked with like Sue bird, you know, I, I knew Sue, I think Sue, it was her, it was her first season was my first year uh, working with them. And so the second season was um, my head strength coach year. And so, yeah, I worked with the team and, you know, it was fun and it was just amazing. Um, so I was like, yeah, just graduating college and going into the practice facility. And I was like, this is my office, you know, like uh, back in the day. So I, I have stories of, um, so anyone that's a Seattle Sonics fan, um, the last year Gary Payton was here, uh, he, that was the year that like they basically traded him. He wasn't really doing much in terms of, I mean, he would show up, play amazing in the games, but like, he wasn't like working out. Like, so there is a minimum amount of days that you, as the being on the team, you had to like work out. I mean, they literally like, you have to train 10 days, at least 10 days. And we, we tracked it in the weight room. There was like a schedule, like basically all the names of the, the players. And you put like a, um, a green circle or a red X every day. Were they in the weight room? Gary was never in the weight room. And he was just like, screw you guys. And, you know, he got, he got fined. Um, I think the NBA was a thousand dollars a day that if you only trained five days out of the month, you got fined $5,000 if you didn't train, you know, so every day that you didn't make the training that was required, you got fined like a thousand dollars or something. I mean, we're talking about working out here, you know? So, um, I saw that whole thing with Gary and then, um, it was really cool to be around, you know, cause I was like, you know, I'm a huge sports fan, but it was just fun to work with them. And, um, and then with the, with the women, you know, I, I think that was a, you know, it's really interesting. I, I literally just put this together right now. Um, you know, we have a huge equality push. When I say rising the tide of entrepreneurial quality around the world, like I freaking mean it, man. And, and I think when you look at all the things around the world, not just the United States, um, it's, it's, it's tremendously disappointing of how much inequality there is. And weirdly enough, I just put this together, amazing, on this podcast, <laughs> that my time with the WNBA was a subtle illustration to me that, you know, the how much inequality there is and how much, you know, talent, those women are very talented. And, and you know, like, I, I worked with both the Sonics and the Storm, and I, I think I saw, like, very early on, like, women can do this too, you know, and they're, they're great. And, you know, the, the storm, like have won a number of championships and, you know, it was, it was just really amazing to be in that position, working with both men and women athletes and realizing like, okay, they're great and they can do this. Weirdly enough, I think that I didn't even internally realize this, that that influenced me to now what we're doing and, and how, you know, women <laughs> deserve equal opportunity to be successful, just like men you know, the, the amount of, um, lack of investment dollars going to dude, if you, all female, le like a full team of just females, the amount of money that they're being given in terms of investment is like, yeah, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's insane. So, you know, I'm not sitting here like shouting at the top of the, the buildings. I'm just saying that's wrong. And we're here to help fix that. Like just, by natural business. Like we will improve that number along with a lot of other organizations that are doing the same thing because it's right. So follow up on this. What's your opinion on this and how do you fix this? Or can you be fixed? Right. And we're talking about where we talk about economics. Suppose you have one person, they come from a two, two parent background, both parents make pretty good money. They go to college for free. You know, they can probably take a year off to college, have a gap year, go work for a startup. You know, I mean, they don't have no worries. Right. They go work for a startup and, you know, potentially make millions of dollars. Another person has to pay for college, single parent, and they have to take a job to take care of their family, right? 
I mean, they probably get a job paying 60, 70, 80 thousand a year. It's not bad, right? But yeah. they don't have the opportunities of the other person. How do you fix that? Or is it just the way life is? Or is it, does it need to be fixed? Uh, I think that's a big gap problem right there. Yeah. The answer to that seems to me, well, the, the, what's, what's happening is when you think about time is finite, so we all have 24 hours in the day. And if one person has to use, use most of those hours to actually just continue life. So like, I need to use these hours to like sustain my life, pay for food, shelter, blah, blah, blah. They're going to have less time for the creativity to go do the things they want to do and maybe build the things they want to build. The person that has more resources might have a little more time to go and pursue the things that they want to pursue. So I think the, the time and money issue is at hand here. But outside of that, I am, I actually, I think that the people that haven't been handed everything are more resourceful. They're more creative to go, to go build or create things because they're forced. Like it's basically like forced innovation. Now, the desire to go do that, like, are they insightful on a a market need? Are they going to be creative enough to go, you know, build something new and find customers? That's the question. But I think that, I look, what I think is underlooked is people that are struggling or the people that are like, you know, having to work two jobs, there's massive drive there. So we just need to orient it the right way. They just need to be oriented the right way. And then, you know, you can't forget like, access to capital and at some point you know uh people that can can help move the enterprise forward so i think um yeah it's unfortunate that there the reality of the world is who you know and how much you know resources and capital you have in one way or shape or form determines if that person is going to move up and be successful by you know founding a company and creating that which kind of re- look i'm kind of i'm floating around here but um I think that that's why blockchain and crypto is interesting because it's breaking that traditional mold. Now I have other thoughts on there's, it's kind of like, well, massive amounts of wealth went into crypto and blockchain. And now the people just shifted their money from traditional, you know, capital into now alternative capital. And now we have something of the similar situation where it's like the rich are getting richer in that and blah, blah, blah. I can go down that road. But the point is, you know, it's opened angles for people to go create wealth in ways that weren't available 10, 20 years ago. So I think that's interesting. So when you grew Founders Live, did you do like, like one city at a time or like one day you had one city and like next we had like a hundred cities? Yeah, we went uh, one at a time. So I started here in Seattle and second, or so started everything in 2014, 2016 was uh, when I changed the, you know, realized like, okay, there's a bigger thing here. And you know, how to change it from Feature Friday. And so created the Founders Live brand and then worked on, So you know, I, I gave some advice recently. Someone was asking me how I, basically same question because they were creating a, a, a concept similar just from a like city standpoint, they want to grow their thing. And I walked them through like, look, you got to, you got to create that playbook. You got to create essentially the unit what is the u- the simple unit of the business, the repeatable unit? And that to us is the playbook, the pack. Okay, again, you know, Bunker Labs is a number of cities, right? So at some point it's like, here's A to Z about what you do and how we run Founders Live and what it's about and how we get started. And, um, and so I had to create that. And then we, our second city was Portland. So it's kind of like that. That was the test city. Like that was like, okay, let's see how this works. I think third city was Boulder. Fourth city was Chicago. And fifth city was like Denver. So I think those are the, our first five. Um, and those happened over like, a few, you know, it's kind of like a few months. We went from one city to then, you know, I think by the end of, by the end of 2017. So, you know, Portland 2017 is when we started with the second city. 
And by the end of 2017, I think we had like five, five cities. What was your first inter- international city? Uh, Accra, well, Accra, Ghana. So why Accra, Ghana? That's because I'm like, seems kind of random. Yeah, it does. Um, the guy reached out to me. I mean, he, he basically, I don't even know. Um, so I, you can see Mexico, Canada, you know, like Ghana. That's like, that's, yeah. I think he joined Founders Live because he discovered it somehow, some way. And I was like, hey, you want to try to do this? Yeah. So Accra was our first, our first international. Um, and then, yeah, like, you know, Mexico, like um, Guadalajara, mm-hmm. we launched there. Um, London popped up fairly quickly. Um, Vancouver, Canada. Um, yeah. So, so when, when companies pitch at your events, it's 99 seconds, mm-hmm. which I mean, is not, it's like pretty much nothing, right? Why 99 seconds? Why not? Um, is my answer to that. Um, so there's probably three or four reasons. Number one, you know, and this is a huge lesson to anyone. Um, if I decide, if I chose 90 seconds, then you wouldn't be asking the question. There is a branding aspect to a very unique, you know, uh, 99 seconds is a very unique number. Uh, it's a minute 39. And I just knew I was like, we're going to be different. We're not going to do 90 seconds. We're going to do 99. And it has worked within our brand. We're known as the 99 second pitch, not the 90 second. Cause there's a lot of things out there that do like uh, nine, you know, minute 30 or two minute pitch or five minute pitch. Um, it's short and brief because no one's got time for any, you know, no one's got time to hear. Honestly, Jason, we appreciate, you know, HR and all that, but no one's got five or 10 minutes to listen to HR, Yeah, but we have 99 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, that's something that this like brief, when you have a pitch competition and you have five companies, I, you know, I was looking at it and I'm like, okay, like it's going to fit in this short period of time. We got to chunk it up and, you know, keep it moving. Uh, so the key of the founders live event is you're never bored. Like the, the thing moves. So yeah, they're pretty fast pace. It moves along and it's like, cool. You know, um, I graduated high school in 1999. So I've always like enjoyed the night. It just was like, I was the class of 99. So it's always been, a I don't know. It's been a number for me. Um, so those are the, those are the reasons, you know? And, um, I think lastly, whether it's a minute, 90 seconds, 99 seconds, the brief amount of time. And, you know, this is now going into Christina and, um, Christina Brennan was our first you know, pitch coach and just learning how to like briefly tell your story, forcing entrepreneurs to have a time limit, figuring out what is the story? What do I include? What do I leave out? What do I save for questions? All this stuff is incredibly important to a founder going through founder's life. You have to go through that process. You have to prepare for your pitch. So rather than saying there's no time limit or rather than saying we're going to give you five or 10 minutes to pitch. No, we're going to give you 99 seconds. And it forces you as a leader to figure out your story and only retain in that pitch, the most important points of your message. So what's your advice on this? Like on most pitch competitions, some more pitch and there's like question answer session. And most of the questions people are actually trying to find out about the company, you know, add value. Yeah. But every once in a while, there's someone to ask questions. You just tell the final place, jump the chump, or trying to show how much smarter they are yeah. than the pitcher or other people. What's your advice to these people pitching to deal with those type of people? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question just because this is, this is a, it's not just Founders Live. Like, you got to be able to handle a, quote, negative question or just, you know, h- how do you diffuse maybe the fire? and I think it's really just, I, I think that there's strength in saying, hey, um, I mean, having enough awareness to realize like, okay, this person's kind of being a negative or they're, they're trying to like, you know, push me under the bus. So being aware of that first off. And then secondly, having the strength just to say, hey, you know, thanks for the question. Before I give you an answer, I want to make sure that we you know, have accurate data or, you know, let me check on that and I'll get back to you. Like, honestly, like 
if an investor asks a question that you don't fully know the accurate answer, thanks for the question. Let me write that down. Let me get back to you so I can, I can get you the accurate answer. You diffuse it by basically pushing it away, but doing it in a respectful way. Yeah. You know, just like, Hey, you know, thanks for the question. Ha ha. You know, um, I don't, I, I really don't want to speak out of turn here. So like, let me get the accurate data. Like, can I follow up with you? Okay. And all of a sudden you've just pushed it away and, and now it's like on to the next one. And that's why with founders live, it's like, especially in the in-person events, next question, you know, next question, like who's next, you know, you can always just like, you know, pass that on. But I think, you know, you don't want to get defensive. Yeah. You know, you just want to. Don't want to attack him back. Nothing like that. So, hey, you know, thanks for the question. Can we follow up after the event or, you know, can I follow up with you tomorrow? So Nick, were you an entrepreneur as a kid also? Yes, I was because I had a paper out. Okay. <laughs> you know, so I, I think about this a lot. Um, you know, I wasn't the, so I have a good friend of mine that, you know, it was just funny. Like, so he's like running his, or he's part of the family business now and he's doing well. But back when we were like in grade school and, and junior high and high school, like he was always like, he was the one that was like, you know, like pay me like a couple bucks and I'll, you know, I'll help you with your homework or like, you know, you can, you can cheat off me if you give me 10 bucks. <laughs> like he was always like, there was always like a, a money or business thing to it. Right. That wasn't me, but I can tell you that um, a very strong indicator of success is when you look at someone's youth and like, what did they do? And uh, I got, you know, I, I did a paper out and for a couple of years, two years, um, it started with my friend and I, um, and I think, I, I think I finished the end of it. Like I was doing it by myself, but first it was like me and my friend, we would put on rollerblades and we had our route and we would like, get, I would get up at like 5am and we'd go out there and we would get the papers, we'd fold them. And then we would rollerblade down the road and just like throw, dude, like I even remember throwing these like newspapers, which by the way, paper route. Like newspapers, like that doesn't, that's, that's a relic of the past now. Um, but we, we would deliver newspapers, man. And, you know, then I would go around. I remember collecting checks, like literally knocking on the door and, and saying like, Hey, it's, you know, kind of time to pay your monthly like newspaper. And, you know, it's like 12, but I don't know what it was like $20 a month or something. And I would get all these checks and then take them to the bank and put them in there. And, you know, like, so a paper route, man, like, and, and so I valued the like work to reward thing, even though, man, getting up early and, you know, that was junior high. And then I'm like, and then equally I would say sports. So sports showing that, that teaches you hard work, training, putting in the effort, seeing the result. So I think when you take those two things together, like I, I did value you know, hard work and effort. And I think in the end, that's really investment, right? It's an investment in yourself. It's an investment in your performance to realize, like put in the hard work now and you investment means the good happens later, you know, down the road. Yeah. I think a lot of us need to go back to our kids, kid days and remember what we do. Cause like me, like I, I'm pretty sure I talk about this, right? I was like having trouble doing sales. Like I don't want to call co calling that sucks, blah, blah. So I was like, wait, when I was in elementary school in Gonzalez, Texas, I worked for a paper called Grit. I used to go have to go knock people's doors and, you know, will you buy this paper for me, right? If I could do this as an eight-year-old kid, how come I can do it as a grown-ass man, right? Like, <laughs> you think about like, okay, this, this is too simple. Let me, let me do this right now. Well, you just pointed something out, which is another thing that I've, you know, personally just kind of been circling around, but also just, I think it's a message for entrepreneurs and founders, which is like, man, what is that fear, right? Like, why would we be scared to cold call? Why would, you know, honestly, like, and just let's break that down, which is like, man, I know it's a little intimidating to like start a sales process, but in the end, you're going to get money out of it or you're going to learn. So like, those are, you know, those are great things. Like you're going to learn some information. You're going to learn more things about yourself and essentially like polish the process of sales. But if you're successful, you're going to get revenue and money. So what's, what's the problem? You know? So I think 
let's get over the fears, you know, le- realizing that fears or being scared of something is only because it's, you know, you, you, you're un- it's unknown or you're just uncomfortable about it. So, you know, get through that just as the young kid. Yeah. You're, when you're a kid and you're like, you're I got to like, knock on this door and like ask for money. Well, like once you do that a little and you're like, wait, I knock on the door, it's like a dog. I knock on the door and a check falls in my hand. Yeah. Let's just keep doing that. Right. Yep. Um, so you're, you're, you're advisor for some startups and of course you yeah. have access to like probably hundreds and thousands of startups. I'm um, sure so you have to get, you probably get um, asked all the time to be on startup boards or advisor boards. Why do you say yes? And why do you say no? Yeah, I say yes. Based on, you know, I think it's like, uh, for a good example is like, there's actually one of our winners out of uh, Bangalore, India. Um, if they're listening, um, how you doing? Um, I'm evaluating, you know, start, you know, to be an advisor for them. And um, they're actually building out a kick. Essentially it's a crowdfunding platform for the country of India, which by the way, the traditional like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, they're like, no one's the leader in those markets over there. It like, it's really difficult in India to actually get a crowdfunding, a rewards-based crowdfunding platform uh, going. Like Kickstarter is there, but it's like hard to use and no, no one's really doing it well. So the moment I discovered this and then I met these guys and these team, it's, it's, a, it's a market that I'm interested in. It's a team that these guys, these two individuals are still, they're like seniors in college and they're, they're young and you know, they're insightful. And so we've had a f- couple conversations and we're going down that road. So I, I think it's unique in um, strategically, I want to work in very, like work with teams in various industries so I can have a, over time, you look at that portfolio of either advisory or investments. And I'm, I'm kind of getting a wide range so I can learn markets and, and all that specific markets as well as specific regions of the world. Um, so my goal is, let's say you go 10 years out, like basically I've got my hands in pretty much things all around the world, you know, so that, that's part of it. I'm working with teams that are in pretty much every part of the world so that what else comes from that? I don't know, but it's probably a good thing. Um, so I view those opportunities uh, strategically as well as like, you know, are they going to respect my time and do they want to work with me? And, you know, do they see the value? And it's not, they're not just wanting to put a picture and a name on a slide deck. They're actually like going to take time and the advice. And so you want to be more than a celebrity startup advisor. Yeah. Mom, man, like they want to, I want to add value and I want them to like be respectful of that. And, um, it's a two way street. Um, you know, and then also like, I think, um, you know, there's, uh, diversity is really important to me and I want to work with people that don't look like me and don't speak like me. And so that's what I'm starting to look for, uh, you know, in, in these opportunities. Can you talk about your own podcast that you do? Yeah. The founders live podcast, definitely search it and check it out and listen. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been really fun. And, you know, traditionally we've been, we just, when I got it started, it was really, uh, the winners and presenters from founders live the basically like in our winners package, there's a link. It's like, Hey, join, you know, jump on the podcast. Um, I've opened it up uh, over the last year to more than just that. And, you know, I had you on, which was great. And it was a great conversation. And, um, but yeah, it's been fun. And I think with podcasts, and I'd be curious your thoughts on this. um, It's such a, it's obviously an, an enjoyable conversation, but it, it allows you to, it, it's a challenge. It, it, it's kind of a little challenge for, you know, like I literally have one or two a week and I still challenge myself on how to, you know, ask better questions or, you know, the pacing of my conversation. Like I just, I kind of do a little mini tests to improve myself and the quality, but it's been really fun. I mean, anyone that's thinking about like, just start the podcast. And honestly, you can't, I don't know if you guys can see us, maybe you're watching the video, but it doesn't have to be this <laughs> produced. You know, this is amazing. And Jason's done a good job here. Um, my setup is definitely not like this and, and it still works. And so you can, 
with today's technology, you can literally get, I mean, use Zoom and just have that recorded and do a little editing and push it onto a, a podcast platform and you're, you're running. So um, I, I, it's been really fun to have great conversations with people, getting stories out. And, um, and that's what, you know, as I say, the Founders Life podcast tells unique and inspiring stories of entrepreneurship from all over the world. And you'll literally hear people from Africa, from Australia, from Indonesia, from United States. And so it's been really fun. Yeah, when I first started, I had like a microphone and, like, you know, nothing else. And, and you just grow through the years. Like, I'm making this number up. But since I did the podcast, I know at least 100 people said they're going to start one. Probably like 10 are still doing it right. Yeah. And like people, you know, you got to be patient. Like you're not going to meet Joe Rogan. You know, you know, like if you go back to Joe Rogan's podcast, the beginning, they're horrible, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and my thing too, like, I, I think the stats are like, if you're in the top 50% of podcasts, you get 100 listeners, which yeah. is actually not a lot. But you think about it, if you have the opportunity to speak to 100, 100 people once a week, undivided attention, would you take that? Probably so, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, so my experience was, is amazing. Like, so I was doing like, I don't know if you remember this, but, you know, actually before Founders Live, um, there was Founders Raw and I was recording, professionally recording conversations like this, but we would go on location. And so it was like, it was like a podcast before it was podcast and it was all video and professionally shot and edited. And um, I, I, it was fun doing that. That was, and, and then I'm like, people are like, why aren't you have a podcast? And I'm like, ah, I don't have time. I don't. So it took me a long time to actually get it going. And um, I was a little intimidated, honestly. And I realized like, oh, you just do this, this, and this, and this. So got it going. And then I'll tell you, and I'm just curious if you experienced this too, but the first probably 20, 30, you're just like, you just got to do it. Yeah. But af there's a point after about 30 where you're like, I might have this. I'm or, getting it. Or if somebody says, yeah, I ask great questions or yeah. great interview or like somebody that some random person puts a comment on your YouTube channel. I really enjoyed this. Okay. I might be doing something right I now. I think I'm doing something right. And it's because repetition. Mm -hmm. And, and then I would say at about a hundred, you're feeling the flow. Like yeah. you're like, okay. I, There's definitely a flow to these things. And you know, a hundred, once you eclipse a hundred, you've got it because the thing is in motion. You've got a hundred under your belt. You're going to have a, probably a hundred more at least. Like it's just, you're, you're going. And, and for me now, I'm kind of at like this, I'm going to shift a little bit of how I do the podcast. Cause I want to evolve the conversations. And um, so I'm still figuring out what that is, but you know, we're at about 140, which is great. And, you know, I think the key is like you having a system to get the new guests in and all that, but it's all about repetition. And, and like I said, I think um, you just learn a lot about yourself and, you know, if you take it, seriously and you actually are paying attention like i'll listen to my own I, you know i don't know if you do this do you listen to your own podcast only when i when i edit it i do like <laughs> you know i still can't stand my voice right like most people right so well, i, I very course. rarely listen to it on like on the platform just so you know everyone's voice sounds weird to them yeah no. so but i listen to mine and it's because i try to listen to it from a quality assurance yeah like yeah how's the conversation going Okay. If I, yeah. Okay. Like I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to shift the way I do that. So I actually listen to them and I try to listen to them because honestly, like there's also things that you, you catch after like, so during this conversation, there's things that if you listen to it again, you're going to catch some of the things yeah. that you might've just because you're doing things and we're in the moment. So I kind of like to listen to them, you know? Um, so yeah, man, like, you know, having a ear to, actually like improve your track your, your craft is important in, in this and so I think if anyone's interested in you know doing podcasts like take it seriously and improve on it yeah one thing just the, the things you learn from your guests right I mean in the insights to take back yeah. I'm always when I talk to anyone I always get so motivated afterward like hey okay to me I, like even you like counting down man I don't know if I want to do this anymore and talk to someone like you or some other people okay no I'm in this for a long call let me let me let me get remotivated and me get back on track yeah. And again, I think the key, what I've learned with a podcast is you got to, I got a link, you know, Calendly link, people can sign up. I've identified the days and essentially I open two hours a week. So two slots actually. So ours is 
you know, yours is a little longer, but ours is, um, you know, it's an hour long segment or 45 minute segment, but like I have a time of an hour to record it. And I just do two of those a week and I do it back to back. I've learned that the days that I do the podcast, like if I have two back to back by the second one, I'm, I'm really rolling. Like, you know, sometimes you get, need some momentum. And then I, um, I have a time to do a bit of editing, but you know, our podcast is not, I mean, you don't need to take three hours and edit it. You take a little short time. And, and that, that's one mistake I made when I first started editing. I would take out every, uh, every duh. Yeah. And like, I was killing myself. And finally someone said, what are you doing, Jason? Like, There's no reason for that. Yeah. Honestly, like, and I'm going to, uh, don't take that out. Yeah. <laughs> um, honestly, like it's natural conversation. That's what it's about. It's not about being the most edited thing out there. And, yeah. Ooh, you know, having an authentic, honest, natural conversation is what pe- I think what people want to listen yes, to. I agree. So of course, like, too many uhs and too many likes like i'm still working on that stuff but the natural conversation Mm -hmm. so for all of you out there it's about recording and getting content together having an efficient way to edit it and then publishing it onto the platform yeah getting that process together you're gonna get that podcast rounded and you know, just how we're talking about branding, just the branding aspect of doing a podcast, right? And you can repurpose, like you can do like 10 minute clips of the podcast and put on IGTV, LinkedIn. I mean, there's so many numerous ways to repurpose yeah. the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. It's going back to like, you have a certain amount of time and how do you appropriate that? It's not easy. So in, even founders time. life, yeah. we're still working around this. We're still trying to figure out like, do we have, you know, look, we have so much content. And we're not actually doing the best job of repurposing it like you're yeah. talking about. Like you said earlier, we all have a team like Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah. We all don't have a Jamie like Joe Rogan does, you know. Share the love, guys. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a great thing. Um, so next, as an entrepreneur or founder, you get all kinds of advice, right? Yeah. Some good, some bad. Like, I mean, it's hard. To me, it's hard to tell the difference, right? Like, you just go, you gut instinct. You're like vetted to other people. Like, what's your advice for that? Well, gut instinct, I mean, honestly, like, I, I mean, there's, there's many ways here, but um, your, your internal instinct, what you would call intuition as an individual, I mean, if you're listening and you're, you're, you're with it and, you know, whatever that means, but if you're very aware of that stuff, I think it's going to be very um, right. What, what does that mean? I think as an entrepreneur, you started something because you saw an opportunity and you saw a vision. You got to listen to that. Um, in addition to asking the right questions from, from individual, various individuals like advisors or, you know, other, other people, um, coaches again, like, you know, so let's, let's just take, you know, and I laugh at this cause you know, <laughs> you know, I'm in a, I'm in a, like, very mountain climbing situation right now like you know the path is not easy and i'm climbing the mountain right now and it's not it's it's painful at times but i've surrounded myself with a number of people that i bounce ideas off of and ask for quote thoughts and advice that's i would suggest combining your gut instinct intuition with insights from advisors or other people around you uh and 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 then combining that to make it that decision so it's an aggregate um going off of only intuition and just gut feel and not talking to anyone is probably not the best advice because you're blind you know again rectangle you know it's like no this thing is multi-dimensional this thing is four-dimensional three at least but four, I think it's four. The fourth one is actually the energy. Like, you know, we don't, don't need to go down that road too much, but this is, this thing, which I'm holding a coffee mug, does have inherent energy to it. And so there's four dimensions on this thing. And when you look at anything of your, your, your company and your choices and all that, you know, you need to start seeing all those dimensions and it's required from your intuition 
to double checking, triple checking through advisors and mentors and other people in the industry, team members. And then in the end, as a leader, you got to make a choice. What's your advice on this? And this is something I got wrong early on, right? Spending money when they need to, right? Like you, I think founders will go, and especially me in the early days, I really don't need this X platform, blank platform, but it's on sale 50% off for six months. It's a great deal. Let me take it. So you're spending this money and once you don't realize like $5 here, $10 out, that shit adds up, you yeah. know, nickel and dime you to death. Then six months later, you spend this money and you never use it, right? Yeah. What's your advice for make sure founders spend the money on what they need to spend it on? As you are establishing your company and building your product, yeah, spend the money on the things you need right now. And, and um, you know, honestly, I, I mean, my advice is, you know, if, if you're being aware of your finances and, you know, let's, let's, let's agree that this conversation is around, you haven't raised 2 million, 5 million. So capital is available. Um, if you're, you know, bootstrapping, you're getting it going, you're scrappy and, and you're just needing to cost effectively launch. Yeah, I think um, fine. Like, are there ways to achieve that result efficiently without spending all of that up front? Um, and then incrementally, you're going to then enter, like you're going to realize, oh, okay, we, we need to use Airtable now. Great. And the thing with like, for instance, Airtable is awesome. We use it every day and, you know, for various things and essentially like a cloud-based um, you know, database the more users you so when you share an air table and you have the more users on air table it incrementally gets it more expensive so you got to look at like okay right now we're, we're only going to have x amount of seats on you know using air tables so we keep the cost monthly you know fairly low so you just want to look at the products and services that are required to uh, get going and yeah honestly I, there's there's pretty much a free or very cheap cost-effective option for most things out there. And then you want to level up as you grow uh, to afford it. But, you know, don't spend the money you don't have or don't spend the money uh, too aggressively as you get going. You want to test your hypothesis first, realize that we're onto something, see the scaling, and then you start, in, in you know, investing in those applications or those tools. Nick, how do you take care of yourself? Oh, good question. Um, you know, I think it orients, first of all, for me anyway, you know, I think physical exertion, exercise um, is a very, very good thing for me. Um, obviously, it's my history, but, you know, I get out and I, I just try to get exercise and work out like every other day. So for me, it's like I'm not manic about it. I run, typically run, but some, you know, I start to do um, strength and exercise outside as well, but I run every other day. And, and, you know, if I've missed two days and it's like, okay, like got to get out there and get it running. And I usually do that in the morning. So, you know, workout exercise, that's, um, that balances me, not physically, but also emotionally. And then, um, you know, uh, meditation. And so every morning I wake up and really spend some time and, and that's a battle as well. Like the mental talk and the spending time in even meditation of what are you actually meditating on? Like, what do you actually, like, what is that experience? And that's personal for everyone, but, um, you know, meditation really helps me stay sane, you know? Um, and you know what I've done going back to exercise, like I have started to even midday or evening, like I get out on walks and like listen to podcasts. And, um, I just, I think for me, if there's anxiety or anxiousness, what helps me is by getting outside and moving, exerting that energy. That's how I dissipate the anxiety. Like if I couldn't get outside and move, I think I would probably go crazy. It would be tough. Um, you know, so I, that's how I take care of myself. And then, you know, uh, as best I can, um, I try to eat, you know, quality nutrition so that I am combined with physical exertion, um, just trying to maintain the best being I can and, you know, staying healthy so that I can then do the thing I need to do. If you're not healthy, either physically or emotionally, you're not going to 
be in the right place as, as a founder and entrepreneur. Nick, so what's your schedule like? Do you like work every day of the month? Do you take weekends off? Do you work hundred hour weeks? Yeah, uh, what I, do you do with that? Um, I, this is something I've been really focusing on recently is like, look, I, I definitely got burnt out this summer and um, I was finding myself working weekends. I was, or like a lot of the weekends, I was finding myself um, pushing it hard. And so I have stepped back from, you know, I think, you know, on the weekend, for instance, like on Saturday, like I, I do enjoy the kind of mi- the, the morning, like I'll get some stuff done, but I am really trying, like, it's like, I am going to adhere to a weekend because going back to what taking care of yourself, that is so important that you pay attention to that. And, you know, look, if you have family and, you know, so I'm, I'm not married, I don't have kids. So there's, there's less of that um, specific needs and focus. So for me, it's even harder because like I could literally work all weekend if I wanted. And I am really trying to balance the other side of my life so that I am actually a holistic person. So, you know, it's kind of ironic, but I go back to like, I, I really try to do like a, you know, the moment I wake up, I'm thinking about Founders Live and doing the thing. Um, but, you know, I get outside and I have my morning routine and, um, and then I'm trying not to work after, you know, six or seven at night. And then I'm trying not to work all weekends. and that takes effort. So especially if you have in cities around the world, right? Like how do you like manage that with the different time zones and different cities? Yeah. So, you know, we're in so many time zones and, um, you know, so we have city leaders, local, our local leadership is, is really running that. And so we have city leader uh, calls every month. And I basically, in terms of Pacific time, I have one in the morning and then, you know, so, once a month, we have our city leader calls and I'll do two. So it's one in the morning, one in the evening. And depending on where you are in the world, it's going to be different, but they have an option of taking, you know, so the goal is to like have two options. Typically it's one side of the day or the other. And, you know, the, e- so for instance, like the evening call for Pacific time, it's basically in the morning over in Asia. So you look at that and um, the next day it's in the morning and, you know, so you just shift it, but um, I will plug a, so I think it's, uh, what is the, it's like a date and time website. I actually don't know the exact name of it, but when I search, like one of the, this website I use so frequently is when I'm going to set up a, a call or a meeting. So something like a war clock converter. It's or literally like, like you pull up this webpage and it's got two boxes your local time. And then you can search any, you can basically change any one of these, but it'll default to your local time zone and city you're in. And then you can then go to like Jakarta or Bangalore or Fukuoka, Japan. And it'll, it'll show the time difference. And then you can change accordingly. So if I'm like, oh, okay, it's like a 9 a.m. If, it, if I want a 9 a.m. meeting, what time is it in their city? And so I use that all the time. And, um, it's difficult to manage time zones, you know, but I, I, I try to, here's another tip is when I am, when you do the, like, what time is going to work for you? I always, I check where they're at. I check their time zone. And then I suggest the time that will equate to what their time would be in their time zone. Right. So it's yes. like, Oh, 5 PM your time. And I'm not going to quote Pacific time. I typically quote their time zone. So it makes sense to them. So they don't have to do the math. They I've already done the math in my head. So Nick, we've talked about Founders Live some already, but now can you go more detail, like how it got started? What are you working on now with Founders Live or what, what, what let, me, let me back try. I have another question first. What city or country do you want to go to next for Founders Live? Yeah. Well, I'll answer that two ways. I'm really excited. We're, we're just launching in, um, in Zurich, Switzerland. Yeah. So um, really excited for Zurich to get going. And I'm of course, at some point going to go there. No doubt. <laughs> Cannot wait for that. Um, and then I'm excited for essentially Sydney and Melbourne, uh, Australia. We're not, we're not on the continent of Australia yet. And I have a conversation. Uh, we have some conversations starting to happen for that, but we're not there yet. And, and it's like, 
it, I've, I've had a few of them over the years and it just hasn't clicked yet. But um, that, those, the, you know, essentially Australia, but um, Melbourne and then Sydney, those two would, okay. be, would be the cities I'm excited about. So now the, the final side question, uh, can you talk about how Funnels Live got started, the background story, yeah. uh, what you work on right now, and what, what you see the vision or the future for Founders yeah. Live are? So real quick, the story is, you know, I guess the very short version of it is, um, you know, I was kind of in, in between projects and um, just want to get people together. And I just threw together this, like, event and gathering. And again, going back to the 99 seconds, I was like, hey, let's, uh, let's have, like, a pitch competition. And we'll just we'll just do 99 second pitches and we'll have a few minutes of questions and then we'll have five presenters. And so I went and got, um, found some founders to, that wanted to pitch and just had that first event. And I mean, honestly, it was like, put it together. And that first event, March 29th, tw March 28th of 2014. And was just an amazing event. And so just kept holding it here in Seattle and um, started to realize like the, the, it wasn't like, Hey, this is, a, you know, let's do this cool event. I think the key was it was building community and, and there was something about people want to be around this thing and it was growing every month we'd hold the event and it kept growing. And, and so I then started to talk with other people around the world. And I think the key was I started to understand that there is talent all around the world, not just the United States, but when you look at other smaller cities in the United States, as well as uh, countries and cities around the world, there is talented people that lack the resources, that lack the information, they lack the connections to the network and the global exposure. So th the, the thing that clicked with me was, wait, there is a major opportunity to create an ecosystem. And essentially what we're doing is we're starting to build this economy around the world, around entrepreneurship, feeding the earliest stages to inspire people, to bring them the access to information, education, resources, capital, and exposure to get them moving in the right direction. And when I looked at that and I'm like, wait, there's almost 8 billion people in the world and there is theoretically 450, if not 500 million, according to some research entrepreneurs around the world. And then you ask yourself, how many more are there if they just had the information network access to resources and exposure? So I just started to look at that and say, this is what we can do. And, and so that's how it really got started. And I think that there's billions of people that can and should be successful in the ventures that they want to create if they had all of that available. And so that's really what it got started. And then, and then, you know, um, that's where I started to realize like, okay, let's name it Founders Live. And then we started down the expansion road as we talked about earlier. Yes. And, um, and you had something going on called a playbook, something like that going on. Yeah. So started that playbook and, and that was the key to expansion. So again, going back to kind of first principles is like, look, if we're going to expand to other cities and countries, like how are they going to know what to do? So they, they, you have to create like a, essentially the playbook, the, the like A to Z of, of how to run Founders Live and how to build the community and be a part of it. And, you know, really it's a repeatable process. And so, you know, I created the, you know, it's not that big, but it's like, here's all the things that you do and here's how you do it. And here's how you get the event going. And, you know, using Eventbrite and other things like that nature and pushing it out and creating the movement. And then we started growing and um, yeah, and, and, you know, really started to take off. So let's suppose a company wins a pitch in Portland, Oregon. What happens next? They go on to the next round, they yeah. win some money, they get certain things. Yeah, so cool. So um, I used to get that question all the time. And the answer then was like, oh, well, you know, it's cool. They get a little recognized. But we, we tested out on a kind of a low, low level last year, uh, what's called now Founders Live Primetime. And so all of our winners, they ev elevate up into a qualification system that then we are looking for the top five startups from each region. So we have five regions of the world. We have North America, Latin America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. And we have created this like 
global series now, uh, essentially regional finals. So those are Founders Live prime time, kind of the regional events. And those happen starting in October. So North America is October 13th. And then, you know, every week from there, it's like Latin America, Asia, Europe, and Africa. And um, these, so these are the top event, the top five in each region that are voted based on like when you're a winner, you elevate up to in the website is primetime.founderslive.com and people vote on the pitch video. Um, and so we stack rank the, uh, the, 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 the list there. And we then take the top five and we have a Founders Live event uh, that, that is like, regional like literally like north america or latin america and those are happening uh, later in the you know in october and november so prime time like that's the evolution of this right so that's where we're going is as we continue to you know get this in all the cities around the world because i think it should it'll be in hundreds you know we're in about 75 80 right now and that means we've had events that doesn't mean they're happening every month because it's weird time pandemic and all the bs that's going on but having this in hundreds, if not thousands of cities, and then creating like this elevated, you know, competition for the ones that, that win and go on, they just get more exposure. They, uh, at some point will have, you know, even more, you know, like winner, what winners maybe get money and, um, investment or really interesting stuff in that direction over time. But I imagine this becoming a, I mean, it's not, it's global right now, but just the a global phenomenon around the celebration of creativity and entrepreneurship that is oriented, not just in cities, but then elevated into the globe. Do you ever see like doing a Founders Live accelerator or Founders Live incubator or anything like that? We, we've looked at that. Um, I think the short answer is we will create things in that direction. Um, the longer answer is, you know, I'm not certain yet the model because you know, look, we're not, there's Y Combinator and it's there and there's Techstars and it's there. And I, I don't necessarily want to recreate what they have. Um, the dynamics are different too. The, the economics are different. So we are looking at how to build out something in that direction that can really serve entrepreneurs, uh, no matter if they are in Seattle or they're in New York or they're in Nairobi, Kenya. It takes a little more thought on how to do that. Um, price points are of concern or, you know, dynamic and they're different if you're in Seattle or you're in Nairobi and, you know, just because that's life. So we got to look at all of that. And then uh, thirdly, you know, just like I always do, it's like, I don't want to do what everyone else is doing necessarily. I want to create something new. So, you know, what does that look like? And, you know, are there courses, are there education? Is it an accelerator? Do we take ownership and equity in these companies? Do we charge for that? We're still looking at what that is, but yeah, I think part of part of the road ahead is um, some sort of, you know, um, some sort of acceleration growth experience for early stage companies. Is Founder Life website still? I think it's called a Mighty Networks platform. It's on something else now. We we are still using Mighty Networks, but um, a little bit of a foresight here is we will be shifting into new experiences that will not involve the mighty networks um that involves we are we are really looking at you know i honestly think things around the blockchain are interesting i think things around um digital assets and and tokens are very interesting and we we actually are seeing some things that we want to do in that direction so the there will be some strong evolu evolution of, of the community and in the brand over the next few years yeah so Nick, is there anything I should ask you that didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Oh man, you, I don't even know what time it is, but you, <laughs> I mean, we've been doing, uh, this is awesome. Um, I think you pretty much hit it all. I think, um, I don't know, like, yeah, I, I would just, um, again, shout out um, Primetime. So if you just search Founders Live Primetime, you're going to, or you go to primetime.founderslive.com there, you can find all the, you know, tickets to the, these are all live stream because they're literally like people from various parts of the world, but prime time. And then the, so there's five events and then there's live fest in December 1st. And it's like our little summit. I mean, it's not a big deal, but in the sense it's like fun, it's global, it's kind of a little summit, but it's about three, four hours long maybe. And um, check those, check those out. It's going to be fun. You're going to meet people from all over the world. So Nick, the companies that pitch at your event, are they mainly tech startups or like are all kind of businesses? You know, a, well, Entrepreneurship for Founders Live means any creative 
entrepreneurial business. Uh, but usually about 80% of the companies that pitch, if not more, have some sort of tech involved because that's kind of the way it works. But um, there's no requirement to be specifically like AI or tech or, you know, um, we, we just, we, we request, or what we look for is, is it novel? Is it, is it unique and different? And, you know, the, the example I use is like, okay, we're Joe's coffee. We're a coffee shop on the corner of X street in this city. And we serve coffee versus, Hey, we have an app. You push this button and 10 minutes later, coffee shows up at your doorstep. Okay. That's interesting. That would probably be a pitch for founders live, you know? Okay. So, you know, if, if you're like a traditional business, doesn't mean you can't be a part of founders live. Doesn't mean you can't be inspired by it, but to pitch, there needs to be a little more uniqueness and, and novel aspect okay. to it. So I'm making this number up like, uh, suppose you get like 20 um, people want to pitch a month, right? And you only pick four or five. What's the process for determining what companies get the pitch? Right. We look for, again, uh, well, uh, first one is idea is in market and you're, you're deployed. So what does that mean? It's like, okay, what's your website? Can we, are, are you, do you have a website? Can I sign up at least for a beta or are you up and running? It's not just an idea. That's the key is we're not putting ideas on stage. You have a business or concept that's running. So you can consider that like bootstrapped essentially. And then the second part is um, the, the, the kind of high level there is um, really a $5 million raise, whether that's quote a series A or not. Like can, <laughs> I used to, in 20, like six, 2015, 2016, I used to say like, ah, $5 million series A. Well, I don't think series A are that small anymore, but um, if they've raised about $5 million, that's about the ceiling because it just becomes unfair. Mm -hmm. Like it's just like, okay, they're these, when you have four that have raised half a million dollars and you have one that's raised 5 million, it's kind of obvious. Um, and then um, we look for diversity for sure. So with all of our cities, it's, they're told like, Hey, you need to make sure that not everyone looks alike. You're making sure that there's a gender diversity here and um, just background in general, like, Hey, let's, let's be diverse in this. So when there's 20, I'm for sure, telling our city leaders, you need to make sure that there's two or three women, two or three men, whatever, you know, like um, you, you're, you got a diversity on that. You, you know, you have a diversity in culture. So we're, we're literally looking at that. And then um, again, is it novel? Is it, you know, is it something that is, is like um, not just like your everyday, you know, physical business maybe. Um, and, and, you know, when you think about like, I just talked about prime time. Well, if someone's going to pitch at prime time, we hope that it's relevant to an audience that's outside of a specific city. So that's kind of one of the aspects of when we look at, you know, it needs to be something that like you listen to the pitch. And even if you're not from Seattle, you're like, Hey, that's cool. I, I would like to use, I'll use that. You know, search the product and maybe you start becoming a user or because the, the whole point of founders live is one of the points is exposure mm -hmm. and getting early stage companies in front of potentially new users or investors or partners. And so it can't necessarily work if it's a physical business in Seattle that only has customers on the street of Seattle and blah, blah, blah. So those are the things that we look for. So Nick, I forgot to ask you this during your pre-talk, but is there any kind of discount or gift you want to give the listeners? Some people do, some people don't. Some can, could be like 30 minutes of your time or a link to somewhere. Yeah, I think, um, well, I'll just, I'll say message me. Um, I'll shoot you a link for Calendly. You know, I, I I also, this is something I didn't say is um, I open up an hour a week for time and mentorship as well. So I've got a Calendly link okay, that you perfect. can you can jump on and basically book time for, you know, advisory or mentorship. And so message me or message Jason, he'll have the link. Yeah. And can you share your social media links for yourself? So people reach out to you. Yeah, I'm pretty much uh, on all platforms. I'm Jay Nick Hughes. So my full name with the J with the letter J in front of it for James, uh, J Nick Hughes on pretty much everything. And to a listener who has a link to his uh, gift and resources and his social media on the show notes, you can find the show notes at www.cavernychrblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with all your networks and friends. Yeah. So Nick, we can remember to talk. Um, can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Yeah. I mean, like final words are, 
I, I really like the question that you asked around believing the belief in yourself. So I, I would leave you with believe in yourself. And uh, look, I, I struggle with that times too. So don't think that anyone is so special. Like believe in yourself, know that anything is possible and it takes a lot of time and effort. And don't think that that hurdle that you're struggling with is going to hold you back. You got to get through it. So yeah. Nick, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Jason, this has been awesome, man. Um, and you, you do a good job. You ask great questions. Thank you. Yeah. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.